talk a little bit about ES 2015. Not allowed to call it ES 6 anymore, I guess. They changed the name. So, ES 2015. How many people actually use it right now? Use it. Wow, nice. Shit. So, about half, I would guess. Half of you have at least used it at some point, I would say. Anyway, so this talk, I'm going to kind of go over what, just briefly, what the features are and how well they're currently supported in, in you know, all the different browsers. And just kind of give an overview. I'm sure even those of you that have used a lot of these features already will be surprised at some of the features that you may not have heard. Even just going through putting this talk together, I discovered a few features I haven't heard of yet. So, anyway. Clickers. There we go. So currently, there's 629 different features in ES 2015, and that's breaking it down to like the smallest possible pieces. So, on uh, let's say an average, I don't have an exact number on, on this, but the overall features I would say around 100, but then those features are all broken down into their constituent components. Um, and so on uh, all the modern browsers right now, we have about 58% of those features that are fully supported, or at least partially supported. So I was a little bit surprised on some of these numbers as I was kind of researching this and going through and figuring out which, which uh, browsers support what or how many things they support already. So IE11, surprisingly, 16%. Yeah, not bad. But the real shocker was Edge, which, you know, is... Uh, Microsoft's new browser, they have a shocking 83% of these features supported right now. That's as of two weeks ago when I first put this particular slide together. And I'll tell you that this stuff is moving so fast that that number is already inaccurate by now. Uh, Firefox, you're looking at about 75% of support on that. So, rock on Firefox, good job. Chrome. I was a little bit sad when I realized that Chrome only had 65%. You know, I'm, I'm a Chrome fanboy, so I'm like, Chrome, what are you doing? Like, I thought they were going to be like 95 or something like that. And then Safari, which nobody cares about, 56%. <laughs> so, but, you know, might as well mention them. Right? Yeah, the sad thing is that every college kid out there in the world who, like, buys a Mac is just Right. Sorry. Well, they don't know any better. So. so is Google trying to boycott them, or? They got some other deal? No, no. So all these companies, you know, Microsoft, Mozilla, and, and Google, they, I know Google at least, I'm not sure about the other two, have made kind of, of a commitment to get as close to 100% as possible within this year So for desktop at least. Uh, as far as mobile, just forget about it. You're not going to get these features on mobile right now. Unless you just happen to be only supporting iOS 9 Safari, because right now they actually, surprisingly, Apple has put a lot of effort into adding a lot of support for that uh, in iOS 9. But that's, I mean, there's a, a handful, I mean, I could count them on, on two hands, how many features are supported right now on other mo mobile browsers. So if you want to support mobile and you don't want to use something like Babel or something like that, just forget about it. Just stick to ES5 right now. Um, anyway, so these other companies, you know, Microsoft, Google, and so on, they're, const they're focusing right now on just getting all the support in desktop first. So figure, you know, 2016 or 2017, maybe they'll have, you know, some decent support on mobile by then. Anyway, so those are the, that's, how many features we have currently on the major browsers? But if we take a look at just the evergreen browsers, which if you guys haven't heard that term before, these are browsers that will update automatically, like Chrome, Firefox, I think Edge does now, but IE 11 does not. Um, and so Safari obviously is out of the question because that has to go through an operating system update to get that updated. So looking, if we narrow it down the set a little bit more, it's a much more impressive number there, 74%. It's not too bad. Um, and I'm kind of an idealist, so for the rest of this talk, I'm mainly going to focus on these browsers. So the evergreen browsers, what features do we have supported for those? So we're, we're going to start basically with what 
the best case scenario and kind of work our way back from that. Um, and I'm not really going to focus on Node, but how many people are using Node? Okay, keep your hands up. How many people are not using Node version 4 or 5? Put your hand down if you have 4 or 5. Couple of hands still. You guys go upgrade. What are you waiting on? So, you know, if you're still on like 0.10 or 11 or 12, go ahead and jump on 4 at least. Anyway, so in Node, we've got about 53%. That's for Node 4 to about 59%. That's the, why the bar is darker there. It's the difference between the two. So 59% on Node 5. And as you guys, I'm sure you know, the 4 version is their long-term support. Long -term support. <clears throat> so you should be at least using that by now. All right, so obviously Babel is not a browser. I don't want to actually like go into details about like what browser or what Babel supports right now, but you know Babel is huge, so I figured I'd give it a little mention here. Uh, when you when you hear or think about Babel, what's the number one thing you think about? Transpiles. Yeah, it transpiles. It takes ES twenty fifteen code and turns it into ES five code, right? <coughs> so you would think a, a tool that does something like that, they must have like awesome coverage, right? They're probably like 95%. What do you guys think? <laughs> Anybody want to shout out a guess? How much do you think it? 100%? 30%? Be of little faith. I was a little shocked to find out. Like, I knew they didn't support everything. I know there's a lot of features that they don't have covered yet, but shockingly, only 75%. So they're right about where Firefox is right now. So think about that for a moment. If you're using Babel, transpile ES6 code currently to ES5, you are already using the same features you could be using on Firefox without Babel or anything else. Anyway, so that was kind of a little bit of a shocker. So here's just a quick breakdown of, of the browsers just so you can get a, a good visual on where they're at currently. So Edge was in the lead at the time that I made this graph anyway. And things are changing very quickly. So. Do you have a question? There's like different pieces of the browser. Like, you know, right, so. It's like the straw man closer to. I can give you guys a link to where I'm getting these stats from after the talk is over, but um, I assume that the guy that did all the research for me, he is counting all of the different you know, plugins and whatnot. Anyway, so you can see Edge is in the lead currently. Right, yeah, I'll, I'll send the link out on the meetup so everybody can take a look at it. But the guy, Tango X, is his username. I forget what his real name was. It's facing right now. But um, he just, I guess, on a whim, went and put all this data together. Like, and, you know, just, I don't know where he, what his sources are, but he put all the data together. I think what he's doing is he's running like test suites against these things to see which features actually. So, work. Are, so these test suites are they officially part of the spec? Or just yeah. So everything that we're talking about today is officially part of the ES 2015 specification. So that's one thing I was going to mention in the beginning is that ES 2015 is kind of like a, a really big hurdle for all of us right now because we haven't had an update to JavaScript since like 2005 or whatever it was when ES 5.1 was finalized and you know and and still like just a couple of years ago some browsers didn't even fully support that yet and they had you know, years to work on it anyway so this particular update is huge because of that because it's been so long that we had any kind of updates to the language but all the uh, ECMA organization they have, have made a commitment to keep you know uh, having their the talks or whatever and discussing which features should be officially part of the specification and finalize those things at least once a year. So every year we'll have minor updates from now on. This one particular update we, it's huge because there's a lot of things that people wanted to get in. Anyway, so a little bit of a hurdle, but it should be a lot better in the future in the following years. All right, so we'll get into some of what these features are and you know, which, which of those have the most support or the best support currently. So obviously I'm going to start with the good, what is fully supported right now. 
and again, this is just evergreen browsers. Yep, we see that there. Yep. All right, so starting off with, we have some object literal extensions. You guys can see that, right? I'm looking at that TV, and I can barely see it. Hopefully, you guys can see it okay, but if not, you can turn around with the TV behind you, one over here. Anyway, so we have a few new features, like we have these computed properties here, which allows you to put an expression in as the property name. This is something people have been wishing for for the last 10 years, I'm sure. Like, uh, I used to spend a lot of time on the IRC channel um, for JavaScript, and uh, a lot of people would, like, new to the language, and one of the first things that would come in there and ask is, like, how do I make a property name on an object from, like, a variable or something like that? Now obviously, you know, use the square brackets and you can do that from a variable, but more complicated expressions, now we can do that as well. Uh, so another one that's pretty cool is the shorthand properties where you just put the variable name and it guesses the rest. So if you have a variable named name, I probably should have picked a better example here, and you create an object with that variable, it will make the property be name and take the value from the variable named name. So shorthand methods, so it's just another way of writing a, a method without using the word function. Uh, and then you have keyed, keyed string, or string keyed shorthand methods, which it's basically the same thing, but now it's like, you, know, you put a space in there, you put a smiley face in there, whatever. Uh, and then computed shorthand methods, which of course is just a combination of the two. And computed accessors. Does everybody know what accessors are? objects. It's like when you have a get, a getter and a setter. Anyway, so accessors can now use computed property names as well. And then here's a fun one, rest parameters. There's not much to say about it other than every other argument to this function will be stuck into y as a, an array. So that dot 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 there tells it any more arguments that you find, put them all into this y variable, or this y parameter. So pretty straightforward. And a spread operator, look familiar? So it's kind of like the rest parameters operator's little cousin or something. Or maybe this is the bigger cousin because it does more. But you can take an array and you can spread its uh, values over something else, like you can spread it into a function or something like that. And you can spread lots of things. You can, so on the right there, you can see an example. Oops, spread all the things. You can see an example of spreading it into a function. You can spread a string into a function that every letter in that string would become an argument in the function and so on. And even, you know, special Unicode characters will work. So six different examples, but these are kind of related to each other. So the these on the second line, the dot 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 one two three would split it into an array of characters. Right. So you have an array. The first element being one, the second one being two, third one. Right, so each element of the array passes it individually in. So it would get out of that spread operator. It depends on what you're spreading and how you're spreading it. So in this case, this string would spread into an array. Because we're not applying it to a function or anything. Here it would spread into you know the arguments for that function. Here, like you were saying, this becomes what basically it just flattens this array down to one, two, three, four, like that. It, you know, something array like. I don't know if it's actual array, like you can type of and it says array. But. On the left hand, does that become a string or something? Or spread it into that? Well, so here you would only do this like in a function or, okay. you know, in here. Oh, okay. okay. I'm just trying to simplify things. You have a question? You mentioned the Unicode on the bottom right. Yes. Yeah. Is it still CS2 or is it actually like UTF-8? Yeah, so it should be UTF-8. 
Um, I'm not familiar with the first one you mentioned. Is it UC2? UCS2. UCS2? Yeah, I'm not familiar there with that. There is some weird thing with JavaScript. But these are called, and I think that that's pretty deep. Yeah. I was wondering if it was part of the ESC spec. That I'm not sure about. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about the UCS2. I'm not sure about. Uh, but these strings like, you can code strings like this and called Haskell plain strings. I don't know why they're called that. But like <laughs> ghost strings or something. I don't know. They're from another dimension. But these types of strings, you know, like, uh, for those characters, sometimes it takes multiple Unicode characters to build one like visual character. But that spread operator knows how to parse that. So when you spread an astral plane string like that, it will actually separate it into the individual parts. Anyway, so we can spread all those things now. So template strings are awesome. This is like, go use this now. If you're not using this, do it. But basically the what you get is basically a backtick for the quotes symbols on these. And then you have placeholders that you can use to insert expressions into that string. So just like the name says, they're like templates. So as you can see, we can do just a variable. We can do a, an expression. Or we can do multi-line strings with this. And that's kind of like, those are the main features. There's also a thing called tag template strings, which are like, Really funky and weird. I don't think I put an example of that in here. Uh, okay, so class. Everybody knows that this is coming to JavaScript, right? How many people are happy about it? How many people are like angry, like, ah, oh, classes? <laughs> okay, everybody else just didn't care. Whatever. Good class. All right. So anyway, so now we have class. I'm sure this is going to cause like a lot of confusion when people first come into the language and they think these are like real classes, you know. But I'm sure all of you know this is just sugar for the prototype inheritance method. Um, so we have, you know, you can define a class and you can extend from one class to create a new class. And for right now, there's like for ES 2015, there's a lot that's missing from this. So classes are here, but they're not complete, and they won't be complete until ES 2016. Yeah, at the very least, if not longer. And then, of course, we have the super keyword, which allows us to call the constructor of the parent class. So you, you can see the example here. I'm calling the super for the constructor of person in order to get the name turned into the amazing Spider-Man. Superpowers with and stuff. So <laughs> I was up pretty late when I wrote that slide. So symbol, this one I'm pretty excited about because I'm one of these nerds that I like I like to go and break shit in the language and like just try all kinds of crazy shit and just see what I can do that should just not happen. You know, things that were not intended. So this is going to allow me to like really play around with some weird stuff. But basically, symbols are a way of creating a, a unique identifier. As you can see on line two and three here, those two symbols are actually not the same. Even though they're created from the same string, you can only compare it with the, the original symbol. Uh, and there are ways of getting a symbol by name. Um, it's basically all the mechanisms now, but there's like a method on symbol look it up and get the original cells. <coughs> What's that? I think it's key for symbol. Might be, yeah. Um, but then you can see uh, here we use an example of like a computer property to create you know, a new property on an object using a symbol. The purpose of symbols is something like Ruby symbols where it's basically for resource, like so that you're not allocating, for example, like if you're using strings as keys to things and you're like recreating those keys all over the place. Symbol instead yeah. is, is a reference rather than like recreating that string every single time it's going to calculate a hash for it and find the that record inside the, the object or whatever. Kind of, yeah, but you can easily fall into a trap where you're going to be doing stuff like this, trying to create the same symbol right. over and over, and then instead you're getting yeah. a bunch That's of That's weird records. that it creates two different references. Like in Ruby, if you need yeah. you, you, you a colon foo, it's the same colon foo everywhere. Right, so it's not like that. But so you can <laughs> make it behave like that with the. Uh, the other methods that are available. 
think it have examples of those on the later slides. It's kind of a weird thing. What's the yeah. intended use case? Well, for having unique uh, property identifiers. So say you want to have a, a particular property in there that you're not going to give anyone else access to it. So this is kind of more like for like meta programming. If you're writing a new framework or something like that, and you want to have properties in there that you can access, but somebody outside mm -hmm. playing with that object can't necessarily access mm -hmm. it directly. But they can describe, like, see what it's called. They can see what it is, but like, they can inspect it, but they can't like go and change uh -huh. the values of it and that kind of thing. Making what? Yeah, you can. I can see that being a use case for it. Probably use it that way. Yeah, I can see that. And there's also other things like, uh, which I believe is on a later slide, but there's other uh, properties on this symbol object like symbol.iterator, which allows you to define what the iterator is. Uh, it's really good stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. You're talking about like the loose equality. Yeah, I know. I didn't try that, but I still think in that case it still won't match. Um, but there are like new, uh, which we'll see in a later slide, there are new uh, features that allow you to compare things better than doing the, the equals and so on. Uh, but let's go ahead and move forward because we'll get to some of that stuff. So reflect is another cool one. Uh, basically, this is normalizing some of the, these quirks that we've had for a long time in, in JavaScript, especially when there's a push to ES5. They wanted to add a lot of features that basically people had been kind of hacking into <coughs> it. Like They added them as fe uh, official features at that time. But they didn't know really where to put some of these things. So we got some weird stuff like object dot proto get prototype of. Why is that on object? Like prototypes, I mean, functions are objects, right? but it would make more sense to have it on a function maybe. I don't know. It's probably one of those things they argued about for days and they were just like, just put it on object. Anyway, so we got reflect now and that's gonna be kind of the new home for a lot of those things that didn't quite really fit where they are now. And of course, object will keep all of those ones that already exist as, you know, for backwards compatibility. Um, but so now we have better ways of doing things. So you can see this is, you know, the way you're used to doing it right here. You can do like a function, apply, object argument, or you can directly use the function object, look at apply call, blah, blah, blah. And then here's the equivalent now, reflect, dot apply, your function, whatever context, and then whatever arguments. So it makes it a lot more kind of visible and <coughs> more obvious what it is exactly you're trying to do. It's a lot less complicated than these, a lot easier to read. Uh, and there's the git prototype of that I was mentioning, so that lives on reflect now. It behaves slightly differently than the object.get prototype of. So object.get prototype of, I believe it returns the object or returns null, if, depending on what it matches. Um, or no, I'm thinking of a different one, not get prototype. No, no, but it, normally it would return the object. The new one returns just a boolean true or false if it matches. This one, get prototype of, would return the actual object. So. Anyway, so both of these, get prototype of and get own property descriptor, those are ones that already exist, but they're on object, and now we're kind of putting them where they officially belong now. Anyway, so we have some new static methods on object. So object.assign, which is great. We've been wanting something like that for forever. We've had to rely on, you know, glow dash or underscore or various other, you know, do it yourself kind of solutions and whatever. But now we have an official method here that will combine objects together. And then this one, this is as I was mentioning before, object is 
it's just a better way of comparing things. So if you take an object and a reference to that object and you say object is, it will be tricky, right? Unless it's a symbol. Unless it's a symbol. Then you got you know, different problems. All right, um, so a couple other different ones. Oh, set prototype. Oh, that's the other one that I was thinking of. All right, so not a whole lot to say about those. I don't want to go like too in depth with it, but I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this, right? And this comes up like at least on a daily basis. I need to compare not a number to not a number. Why can't I do that? Right. Now, for all of those times when we need to know is not a number, not a number. Now we know. So object is gives us that ability. So excited. All right, now we have octal and binary, binary literals now. So, you know, we have all kinds of different literals like Unicode literals and so on. Now we can describe octals and binaries in the same way. Yeah, interesting, I guess, if you're like doing some crazy math stuff with this, but moving on. So some new string static methods. This is one of the ones that I was telling you it's like a, it's not the template, uh, or sorry, not the tag template string, but it's something related to that. They both work in the same way. So this string dot raw here, this is actually a function call. How many people would have guessed that? So for some weird reason, these particular uh, tag-like methods that operate on template strings don't require the, in fact, you can't use the parentheses around the value. Well, I don't know. Anyway, so that's pretty much the only new static method for strings. Sorry, string. Thank you. But you can see how it works. The bottom there, string.raw, if we you know, put a value into it and make it a multiple line, that's what string.raw produces at the very bottom. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like you made a typo or something. Yeah, those are pretty strange. It's going to take some getting used to. All right, but we do have a handful of new prototype methods on strings. So you can do get, uh, sorry, not get, code point at, normalize, repeat, starts with, ends with, includes. Those last three especially are going to be really useful for doing matching and comparison and that sort of thing. Um, so we don't necessarily have to build a red, regular expression every time we want to match, you know, does this string end in the, end in the period or something like that. And then repeat, you can make it some repeat as many times as you want. Some of these things are kind of like, oh, is this really going to get used? What would your position like? Uh, a lot of these things, so like code point out, you know, is a good example. And then if we go back to back, stuff like this, again, a lot of these features are more for like the metaprogramming world. So, you know, Angular 3. It's going to be using a lot of this kind of stuff, but whatever. You know, React 27, you know, once they get on to using the ES6 features directly, right. they'll be using a lot of that. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of these things, you can do away with Lodash now because a lot of these things are built in there. All right, so. Is there a question? Oh, I was going to say, it's also probably kind of low level, so it's probably a, a lot faster than doing functions with Lodash. Maybe, maybe not. It depends on how the browser implements it, because Lodash is still faster than most browsers with certain operations that it does. Lodash is also trying to like, prompt game over and then produce faster. Right. Not, yeah, that's a good point. So if anybody couldn't hear, he was saying that Lodash also fails over to using the faster, whichever one is faster, the native implementation or their implementation. So that's a good point as well. But now we have more of these things built in. So now Lodash has more to choose from. All right, so we got some new number properties. Uh, you know, so you can check, is the number finite? Is it an integer? Is it a safe integer? So in other words, having a decimal in it means that's not safe. So again, like is safe integer, you're gonna to need to be doing like some crazy math calculations <coughs> to ever care about that. Yeah. Anyway. And here again, 
county and see if man is man. All right, and then a couple of new like properties, Epsilon and MinMax safe integers. <laughs> then a whole heap of math methods. Does anybody care about these? <coughs> One person? Well, you're outvoted. <laughs> <laughs> so we got some non-strict function semantics. And I think, I don't know for sure, just taking a, a fairly educated guess here, some of these things are being built in for backwards compatibility with sites that were built using like quirky features that, you know, some, some browsers, I'm not going to name names, may have built in that were not actually part of the spec. So they just said, okay, that's easy. We'll just throw it in. Why not? But they put it in as you can only use it in non-strict mode. So that particular aspect of it right there kind of tells me, okay, that's something for backwards compatibility. Because if you're going to be using strict mode, that means you shouldn't be doing this crap. I don't even know what it means. Okay. All right, so, oh, this one definitely. I know for sure that this one is a backwards compatibility thing. I know, I'm sure probably everyone in here has seen this dot, you know, the, uh, the double underscore proto double underscore thing before. That was kind of, I don't remember which browser we see if you're starting that, but it was kind of like a, a hack way of building in a, a better way of interacting with a prototype of an object. And it was never officially in the spec. And now we're just going to say, OK, we're making it official, but we're only using it for backwards compatibility. You should not be using it. Give it away. So anyway, then probably you can do the object as well. And then we have some regex syntax extensions. So, uh, actually, those are a lot of those are pretty cool, but it, there's nothing really to show. So that's why I just stuck a little picture there for you. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So those are, as of at least like last night anyway, could have changed by this morning. Those were all the ones that are completely supported in all the evergreen browsers. All right, so what was that? No less than like a dozen, close to 20, I think, features, right? So even if you want to use just like one of those features, you can start using it right now. All right, so let's go on to some features that are almost fully supported, but not quite. Use these with caution. This is one of the ones I'm most excited about. There's a lot of cool things you can do with this. I'm not going to go into real in depth with that. That's probably like a whole new talk all of its own. Um, but just a really short example you can take. Basically, what this is doing is taking an object and kind of wrapping it in a new interface, a proxy, if you, know, if you will, that anything you do to that proxy object will happen to the real object unless you tell it not to, unless you change the behavior somehow. Does that make sense? And that's just one way to use class. Anyway, so those are really complicated. Again, this is probably, you're not going to touch these unless you're building a language. You might see them, but it's not going to be common for you to have to write those you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, maybe test or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So say you have a validator and maybe you decide like, you know, you have some crazy validation rule that like every word of their blog post has to be capitalized. Like, you know, just the first letter or something like that. Well, maybe you don't want to like piss off your users by making them go and completely rewrite all of that. So you can just capitalize it yourself if you want. Really bad example, don't do that. But, <laughs> But yeah, it's a good point. You can use it to do other things, not just throw errors. You can mutate the values or something like that. And then this one is really big. This one you will hopefully use on a day-to-day -day basis if you know what's good for you. This basically, you know, we've had it like ever since 2005 ish, we've had a million and one uh, libraries under the sun all 
you know, coming up with their own way to do asynchronous style. And then at some point, someone came up, up with the Promise A plus specification, which kind of reined in some of that. But now we have an official Promise token. Talking. Are getter setters compatible with asynchronous stuff? Like this? I don't know how you use it, yeah. I mean, you can combine any of these things together. Well, like basically, like you want to wait on your getter setter to complete before you do the next thing. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah, so you may be able to do that with like a combination of promises and proxies or something like that. So a lot, a lot of power in that proxy stuff. Dan should definitely go and like read about that at least. Just to kind of see like what interesting stuff is capable of. But yeah, I mean, you could, there's definitely a way you can do it. So, yeah, so promises are, are a really big deal for async functions, but unfortunately those are ES 2016. So we won't be talking about those today. And begin to love promises. Right? Yes, you will love them. <laughs> you will learn to love them. Anyway, so even if you don't interact with this particular promise directly, I guarantee you every you know, jQuery and every other language that's using some kind of promise behavior is eventually going to switch over to using this. Why? Because it's a lot less boilerplate for them to write. Anyway, so you can create a new promise. I usually wrap that like in a function to pass whatever value I need into it, but just keeping it simple there. I'm just creating a new promise, and then when it's done, do something with it or handle the error. And you can create promises that are already resolved or already rejected. So you're not actually even doing anything with it, you're just saying, Resolve it immediately with this or whatever. Sets, maps, weak sets, and weak maps. So these are almost fully supported. I think every browser has mostly got it. There's like you know, a couple little like minor features here and there that are not implemented, but for the most part, you can use them. Um, and I'm not going to go into real great detail on these, but they're all very kind of closely related to each other. But you've seen an example of a map. It, you can kind of liken it to an object. It's very similar in how it works, but the underlying details of how that's implemented is a bit different. And then a set is like basically an array that can only have uniques in it. it can't have the same value more than once. Yeah? Is there a like, recommended format? It can be, yeah. Well, memory, yes, absolutely. Um, weak maps are what you want to use, or, or weak sets, the weak ones are what you want to use if you're doing something that's really high performance and you really need to make sure you keep your memory uh, in check. Uh, because these ones uh, will release the references to whatever they have inside for garbage collection. Right, exactly. Set and map will not release. You know, I, I didn't look into that. That's a good question. So, if somebody wants to make a note of that, we can look at it. Yeah. Sets need to be based on the next guidance. If you do anything for you in the sense of you throw to the same value added and you just want to say, right. You just, if you set, so if I did set set one, two, three twice, just the second one, it would it would not like throw an error or anything, but it just wouldn't show up. Right. Right. So yeah, there's a lot of cool things that you can do with them. Again, I didn't want to get like too in depth with that, but they're they're really cool. There's a lot of stuff, awesome stuff you can do with it. Go and look it up. Go and learn about it. All right. Generators also really cool. You can basically make functions that spit out values constantly. So you can make it set out or spit out like from a limited set of things, and it just gives you each of the values one at a time. Or like in this example here, you can create like a counter or something like that, that just as many times as you want it, it'll give you a new value. So you just keep counting up for infinity if you want. So 
Be careful with that. Don't put that in the for loop. Well, that's what's making it an endless loop. So basically, while true, if you were to go into like your dev tools or something and say while true, you know, console log hello or something, you'd get hello indefinitely until your browser crashed. Right. Yeah. So that's just my way of, you know, I'm just incrementing the value. So I could sit here calling next value as many times as I want, and I'm always going to get a new value. Yes. Are all variable assignments that, that do not use the word get or var? Uh, are those all local scope? They are just any kind of Well, so var is not still. Var has not changed. It's going to work the same way it always has. But let and const, those are local scope. Or block like scope. Is, what's that? Is that by default? What is? Just there's no, uh, there's no keyword before n. Is it n equals 0? Oh, hey. I think it was late when I wrote that. <laughs> oh, I was wondering if I was like, um, so that that would technically be var, and that's now global. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is like two a.m. <laughs> right. So that star, I should have put that in bold so you guys could see that more clearly. That star right there is what is making that a generator versus a normal function. And by the way, just a side note: you cannot create a generator from an arrow function. Sad but true. Hopefully, maybe someday, maybe ES 2018. Who knows? Hey. Arrow functions. Right. So, obviously, just a, a much more concise, shorter syntax for writing a function. These are especially great for callback functions because, you know, when you're trying to pass a function into another function, sometimes it's just doing something really simple, like a one-liner, and you don't want to necessarily write function, you know, parentheses, curly brackets, and break it into separate lines and all that. Or even if you do make it a one-liner, this is a little bit shorter, a little bit more concise. I was just going to mention that. So the other benefit with arrow functions is lexical scoping. They do not have their own scope. So they take on the context of their parent, whatever parent scope they happen to be created in. Um, and then you can do shortcut things like this, console log. Obviously, it doesn't return me a value, but why put all the uh, curly brackets when it is going to evaluate that? It'll still return undefined, but it'll get executed. So if you wanted to return a value, like that's what this one is doing here, shortcutting that so you don't have to say, you don't have to use a keyword return, right? Whatever follows that arrow there, if it's some sort of expression that produces a value, it will try to return that to whatever its caller is. Right. Did somebody have a question? I thought I saw one. And of course, I can't talk about arrow functions without showing off a Y combinator. <laughs> so I've been obsessed with these things for a little while now. I wrote a blog post about them. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Those things, my God, it took me like a year to figure out even how they work. Okay, so we now we have let. We just talked about that. So let is block scope. You can see right here, this block B will only exist within that for. Uh, the same thing applies to comps, which, was, which we'll see in a sec. So just a couple of examples. You can't, they're kind of like constants in that you can't uh, declare them again, but you can reassign the value. So if you try to declare it twice, you get a syntax error. Out here, if you try to reference something that was de uh, declared within a block, you get a reference error for that. And then comps are pretty much exactly the same. The only difference is that you can't even assign a new value. So you can't re-declare it, you can't reassign it, and, you can't, and it has the same block scoping. Right. Obviously, objects you just can't use for reference. That's correct, because objects are by reference. So you can change their content, you just can't change what object is there. So, yeah, excellent point. All right, for of loops. So, you guys are familiar with the for in loop, right? We can use on an array, basically. For of is just another way of doing this on arrays and objects. Um, 
not much to say about it, but it's nice to have. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> so it's just a, a simpler way of doing like array for each. And then that elm, do you use it outside the scope of that for? Like after that for, is that elm going to be valid or is it going to be? No, nope, because it's let. Right. Yes. So that's like a use. It's gone after it's not there. So you can't right. use it. Right. You can't set it. Exactly. Yeah. And you can pass it around. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm just using an array literal invented just to make it simple. Oh, yeah. So if it was an object, you'd be iterating over the properties of it. I guess I should have put another example. So with an object, you can split, like where you have the let here, you can split the keys and values into two, two different variables. And so you get two variables for the price of one, basically. You get I guess that's more of an example of um, key structuring more than anything, but still. Anyway, so the of is what's important. It lets you do those types of things a little bit easier. Let's see, could I have? No. Nope. Uh, what are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> so typed arrays, there's a whole bunch of new typed arrays. Again, you have to be doing some pretty low level stuff to ever want to use these. So we'll just get past that. So one, one odd thing about JavaScript that I see is that there's still no unsigned 64 bit keys. That's true. <laughs> yeah. uh, so if you want to deal with really big or something. Yeah, I wonder if that's just a limitation with the browser itself or what. All right, so properties can actually have an order to them now, so you can actually count on the fact that the properties will be in a specific order. ES5, we couldn't ever really guarantee that. Most of the time it worked out okay, but every once in a while it would jump up and bite you in the ass. Now it won't. Not really a way to show an example of that, so we just move it around. All right, so we have block level function declaration now as well. So before, what might happen is this inner function actually would be declared in the outer scope, but now this function will only exist inside of its outer function. So that's all that is. Now we can define them or declare them at a block level. All right, new.target, again, kind of, you know, for meta purposes mostly, if you're creating, you know, constructors, and you need to know, was this constructor function called with using the new keyword, you can now say, well, was the target the same object as what was called, right? So before you had to do like all this like instance of crap, now it's just much simpler. Okay, Unicode, Unicode point states. Um, not much to say about it, but you can see the equivalent on the right hand, you have to use two Unicode escapes and then a code point escape. It's a little easier. I don't know when anybody's ever going to use that. Oh my gosh. HTML style comments. Why? <laughs> so this is a thing now, you guys. Now in your JavaScript, you can use HTML style comments. Yeah, maybe JSX, that'll be helpful. But I don't think JSX really counts, does it? Because JSX takes care of that on its own. Like, it didn't need that in the language to do that. JSX makes you do uh, <laughs> curlies and then do the regular style. Oh, you have to put the curlies yeah. on them. Yeah. Right. So whose idea was this? Yeah, OK. Well, <laughs> maybe that'll be better for, yeah. <laughs> for Dreamweaver users. <laughs> All I know is that's what I think of it. <laughs> <laughs> I see HTML style comments, and I'm like, <laughs> All right, so the bad, so these are the ones that have really, really, really kind of iffy support, but they, you know, at least one browser has a little bit of support. So we can now look at what the prototype is of a bound function. So if you bind a function, you can still get its prototype. It used to be that, I don't know if any of you guys have ever run into this, but when you bind a function, <coughs> I was working on a library years ago where I had to know 
was this function already part of this set, right? And we didn't have sets yet, right? So I had to try and compare that function, because it's an object, so you can compare them. But if we bound the function, then it would not match because they were not they were no longer the same object. But basically now there's a way to track <coughs> these things a little bit better. It's not quite, it's still not great, but it's better. So you can at least get the prototype of it now. Nothing much more you can say about that. So this will be fun for you know people who help out on Slack or Stack Overflow a lot. Because you're going to get tons of people going in Stack Overflow saying, hey, I extended array, and now everything's completely fucked. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> so we just you know, made uh, Stack Overflow more popular is what we're trying to do here. <laughs> but basically, all the built-ins, array, you know, regular expression, function, all of those things, you can subclass them now. Weird. And we have a few, or just a couple, I guess, new static methods on array. So you can turn an object that looks like an array into an actual array. You can take, you know, a few arguments and turn them into an array. Again, this is more like stuff Lodash will use. It's not necessarily something else here. Uh, and then copy it in, find, find index field for these value entries. Draw new things on the prototype. Actually, earlier today at work, I accidentally gave someone some misinformation because I was thinking of this new feature. So now we have object.keys. That's already been in ES5. But now we have, on the actual array itself, take that array and just say .keys and get its keys rather than doing object.keys and putting the array in there. So that or the object, whatever it is. You know. But a little bit better than doing with the object.keys, right? Again, that's one of those things where it's like, why use object.keys? Even a thing, like getting the keys of the object, sure, but makes more sense, I think, in this context. All right, um, so values and entries. I think those are, what's that? So an entry is like when you have um, an array of, like, I want to use the word sets because they're not real sets, but you know, you take an array and you have inside of that each element is an array of two things. Those are, each one of those things is an entry. So, not sure why we needed that built in, but we have it now. Um, and then the values would be the right half of those things. Right, so functions now have a name property. So if you access dot name on a function, you get what the name of the actual function is. This would be really good for like, you know, stack traces and, and stuff like that. You, you know how often you look at those stack traces and you get like, it says anonymous function or something like that. Now just name all your functions and then whatever library you're using can know what it is instead of just saying anonymous function. All right, so these are the other things I was talking about on symbol. These have really bad support so far. I mean, we have like the core symbol object, but we don't have all of these kind of the, the well-known symbols is what they're called. So like iterator, search, root, match. Those are all species. <laughs> don't go there. I, I think species has something to do with like um, instance of. So you can check, is it like an instance? Seems like somebody had a really hard name on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so basically what you can do with these, you take these and stick one of them into a computed property on an object, and now you've just redefined the iterator of that object. <clears throat> so, yeah. Which is some, something that's fun to play with, but again, it's more metaprogramming than anything. <laughs> So you can see a lot of these features, like all those ones that were right up front, those were all features like that we want and that we can use right now. But a lot of these features that have less and less support, we're getting more down into like, this is all metaprogramming kind of stuff. So it should give you a good idea. Like if you want to start using ES6 now, sorry, ES 2015 now, most of what you want is already supported. 
All right. Um, destructuring. One of my favorites. So you can destructure parameters. So <coughs> this function here, if you call it with an array, that array will get split into, you know, individual uh, variables. And objects will, can be destruct, uh, destructured. So if you pass in a property that has, or, a, or an object that has the, the property name, that will become an individual variable called name, which we can then destructure. So you see example here, pass in name Bob. So this variable name will be Bob. <coughs> okay. So that's really cool in my opinion. Destructuring assignment is where you take, you know, an object and you can assign multiple, like for instance, an array or an object, something like that. You can assign multiple variables at once from that. So it makes your job a lot easier. And you can see here, I put in a kind of a like little gotcha example. You can actually add some <coughs> extra commas to skip over ones that you don't want. So I skipped the number two and put three into V there. Anyway, good to know. And then a destructuring declaration is literally the exact same thing, except you can put the var or let or const, whatever you're using, in front of it at the same time. So you don't have to do it in two steps like we did there. All right, default function parameters. How many people have gone through the trouble of creating a function that checks to see, well, did this argument have a value? Was it a function? Was it an object? You know, trying to figure out what was actually passed in on like the second or third parameter. How many people have done that? A couple of people. I've had to do that a lot, so I'm pretty excited about this one. Because now you can just say, you know, say A is like, object you're operating over and then B is maybe just some options for it, right? You can set what those options are by default right there and you don't have to go and say, well, if options was undefined, maybe it's just, you know. You showed a, like a best operator earlier, like with the, yeah. the rest of the, of the parameters could be an array. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to get that into an object or a hash or something? Mm -hmm. like, well, it's just like in Python, you can do like asterisk args, or you can do like asterisk, asterisk kwrs, and you get like a dictionary. You get like a dictionary of the you mean to like get it into a set or something like that? Uh, it gets into like yeah, like a hash, or it's just a JavaScript object. And JavaScript. I think we can do something similar to that with the destructuring Destructor. parameters, but I don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about. I'm not real familiar with Ruby. Play around with Ruby like 2006, but didn't get real deep into it. Uh, where were we? So regular expressions have a couple new flags that we can play with. Right now, the only one that is even supported in all the browsers, in fact, is Y. So Y just allows you, what is it called again? Uh, hard to explain. So if the reference has already matched so like this P or the B or something like that. So it's already been matched. You can tell it how many times to, or when to stop matching it, I guess. I don't even know if I'm describing it correctly. Uh, but then the U flag is for Unicode. So now you can you know, find happy faces in your strings. All right, I'm almost done. So the ugly, these are the ones that like literally no browser has support for. Sadly, uh, we don't so, prototype flags, you can get the flags of a regular expression. Boo. But this is the one that's really got me kind of wishing we had already. Tangle call optimization. Who knows what that is? Anybody? A couple of people back here? Anybody? All right, so basically, how many people have seen this error in the console? My students back there better be raising their hands. <laughs> so this is when you call a function and it starts building a stack. Usually that happens with recursion. And it just calls too many times and the browser runs out of memory or something like that. Or you know, it prevents itself from running out of memory by setting a limit on it. 
Anyway, so now with tail call optimization, we don't have to worry about that. You can have a function recurse into itself to the end of time, and the browser will not care. So, have fun debugging that one when you fall into that trap. But it's a really exciting feature because this is going to make uh, like recursive functions and, and things that do similar stack um, operations. They're going to be like 10 times more performant now. So, Lodash, you think Lodash is fast now? Wait till you see it when we get this. All right, so that's it. There's only two features that have zero support right now. So not too bad. How do you guys feel about ES 2015? Is, it, is anybody like ready to run out right now and go write some ES6? Somebody, you know, hasn't tried it before. So what do we do now? Don't learn it. We didn't start until about like 1040 and I switched to Because it's not in ES 2015. So <laughs> you have to wait a little longer. On that one. Where does that come from? What do you mean? Right, so it's ES. 2016, so I mean it's in the spec, but it's just not like the ES 2016 spec isn't final yet. So, yeah. Is that true? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was like, I thought I was using it that way. But, yeah, so you're saying the, the spec, what, what currently at least, is not... <laughs> Yeah, so I, I guess by by the specification, that's not what it's supposed to do. But Babel is like, we don't care, we're doing it anyway. All right. Right. It's one of those things they were just like, you know what, that's stupid. We're doing it the right way. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing, we're kind of way off topic now, but I think the thing with import that bugs me the most is that it can only be at the top level, like it can't be inside of a block. Oh my god, the thing that's bugging me most is that you can't make the uh, string of the finger pointer in. That would be right. You never should have done it in the first place! There's five million, there's two <laughs> spaces. No, there's not. It's not doing it. <laughs> I, I think what Brad's talking about is when you do like var equals and then require it right in there, right? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, really? Right. right. Yeah, so, anyway. So, this is my last slide. Let me just go through this real quick and then we'll open it up to like questions and discussion or whatever. So, what the hell are you waiting for? I don't know. Yeah, it's 2015, though. No. Go learn it. There's no excuses anymore. But my boss won't let me. Whoops. Why are you telling your boss about it? Do you ask your boss <laughs> how to write a function, right? That's forgiveness. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> just do it. Your boss isn't going to care or know. He just wants you to get your job done. Honestly, like some of these features will help you get your job done a little bit easier. So your boss will probably be happy about it. All right. So what about older browsers? I have to support IE6 still. Well, sorry. Sucks to be you. But if you have to support like IE10 or 11 or whatever, it's not too bad. You can use Babel. There's polyfills that you can use if you don't want to use Babel. So there's a lot of different options. So hopefully through this talk you saw at least kind of a glimpse, even without Babel, without any kind of polyfills, there's already several features that you can take advantage of, advantage of right away. Uh, what about the modern browsers that don't even support, you know, tail call optimization yet or whatever? Well, again, not tail call optimization is a bad example, but for those other features, just use Babel. Babel's the answer to all your problems. It's the answer to all your problems. <laughs> anyway, so support for all of these is growing like really quickly. I mean, literally, the, those first slides, the stats that I was showing you guys, 
I had to kind of lie to you guys a little bit because I didn't want to go and change all those slides. Literally, Chrome just released like a whole crap ton of new um, support for a lot of these features. So Chrome was at 65%. Is it the guy from GitHub? Yeah. Tango X. So Chrome went from like, in, in the time it took me to write these slides, they went from 65% to over 90% on supporting these features. So. And, and that's not just them, Firefox and Microsoft, they're all moving along at a nice steady pace on these. So by the end of the year, we should have the desktop, evergreen browsers should be like at least 90%, all of them. Anyway, so that's it. Thank you guys. There's me.